A kind surgeon adopted five black boys 13 years ago, raising them like his own children. But now he gets a shocking call in which a voice from the past threatens to destroy his family. Who is behind this mysterious call, and how will it affect the surgeon's future? Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today. And if you like this story, don't forget to subscribe. Nurse Ava Johnson moved from room to room with practiced ease, her gentle smile bringing comfort to each patient she visited. Her colorful scrubs, decorated with cheerful flowers, seemed to brighten the sterile hospital environment. Good morning, Mrs. Peters, Ava said softly, adjusting the elderly patient's pillows. How's that shoulder feeling today? Much better, thanks to you, dear, Mrs. Peters replied, patting Ava's hand. As Ava finished updating the patient charts at the nurse's station, Dr. Michael Richards approached, his white coat crisp and his manner friendly. Nurse Johnson, making everyone's day better as usual, I see. Ava looked up with a warm laugh. Just doing my job, Dr. Richards. These patients make it easy. Well, most of them. She winked, thinking of old Mr. Thompson who'd been grumbling about his breakfast earlier. You have a way with even the grumpiest ones, Dr. Richards said, leaning against the counter. Say, could you help me with something? I need Mrs. Martinez's file from last month. It should be in storage downstairs. Of course, Ava replied, gathering her things. I'm heading that way anyway. I'll bring it right up. Thanks, Ava. You're a lifesaver, Dr. Richards called after her as she headed toward the stairwell. The stairs were quiet compared to the busy hospital floor above. Ava's shoes squeaked slightly on the polished steps as she began her descent. Her mind wandered to her children. She needed to remember to pick up ingredients for Tommy's class project. And Sarah had a dentist appointment next week. Lost in thought, she didn't notice her shoelace had come undone. Mid-step, it caught under her other foot. Ava's eyes widened in sudden panic as she felt herself pitch forward. Her arms windmilled desperately, trying to grab the railing, but she was already falling. The world spun around her as she tumbled down the concrete stairs. Each impact brought sharp pain until a final, devastating blow to her head plunged everything into darkness. She lay still at the bottom of the stairwell, unmoving. Moments later, Nancy, one of the pediatric nurses, pushed open the stairwell door. Her cheerful expression transformed into horror at the sight before her. Oh my God! Help! Somebody help! Her scream echoed through the stairwell and into the hallway, bringing running footsteps and concerned voices from every direction. Two nurses reached Ava first, immediately dropping to their knees beside her still form. She's unconscious, breathing shallow, one of them called out, checking Ava's vital signs. There's significant bleeding from a head wound. Get a backboard and neck brace up here, stat, another nurse shouted, and call the ER. Tell them we're bringing her down. Within minutes, they had carefully secured Ava to a backboard, mindful of potential spine injuries. Blood matted her dark hair and a bruise was already forming on her temple. The team moved with practiced efficiency, but their usual professional detachment was strained. This was one of their own. Someone page Dr. Richards, a nurse called out as they rushed Ava toward the elevator. He needs to know. In the ER, Dr. Richards burst through the doors, still holding the chart he'd been reviewing when he got the call. He stopped dead in his tracks at the sight before him. Ava, who had been smiling and chatting with him just minutes ago, lay motionless on the trauma table, her skin pale against the stark white hospital sheets. What? What happened? He managed to ask, his voice barely steady. Found at the bottom of the stairwell, a nurse reported quickly. Probable severe head trauma, multiple contusions, possible internal injuries. Dr. Richards shook himself out of his shock. This wasn't just any patient. This was Ava, who always had a kind word for everyone whose five children were waiting for her at home. He couldn't let his personal feelings interfere with her treatment. Start a CT scan immediately, he ordered, his voice finding its authority. I want a full neurological workup. Check for internal bleeding. His hands moved surely as he examined her pupils with a pen light. Get an IV started and prepare for possible surgery. The ER team moved like a well-oiled machine around him each person knowing their role. Monitors beeped steadily, showing Ava's weakening vital signs. Dr. Richards worked methodically, 
pushing aside the image of her cheerful face from earlier that morning. Blood pressure's dropping, a nurse announced. Push one unit of O negative, Dr. Richards commanded, and get neurology down here now. He leaned over Ava, checking her responses. Come on, Ava, he whispered, too quietly for anyone else to hear. Stay with us. The team continued their work, following Dr. Richards' lead as they fought to stabilize their colleague. Despite their best efforts, Ava's condition remained critical, her body showing little response to their interventions. Dr. Richards gripped the edge of the trauma table, his knuckles white with determination. He would do everything in his power to save her. He had to. The hours crawled by as Dr. Richards stood vigilant at Ava's bedside. His surgical scrubs were wrinkled, and dark circles had formed under his eyes. But he refused to leave. The steady beep of monitors filled the room as nurses moved quietly around them, checking vitals and adjusting equipment. Doctor, her oxygen levels are dropping again, a nurse said softly. Dr. Richards nodded, his jaw tight. Increase oxygen flow to 100%. Let's get another chest x-ray. He leaned over Ava's still form, listening to her breathing through his stethoscope. The sounds weren't good. Start another round of steroids, he ordered, running a hand through his disheveled hair. And get me the latest blood work results. The team worked tirelessly, following each of his commands with precision. But with every passing hour, Ava's vital signs continued to weaken. The head trauma had been severe, and despite their best efforts, her body was showing signs of giving up. BP's dropping fast, called out another nurse. We're losing her. Dr. Richards moved quickly, starting chest compressions. Push one amp of epinephrine. His arms worked mechanically, counting compressions as he watched the monitor. The flat line remained unchanged. Come on, Ava, he muttered, pressing harder. Think about your kids. They need you. Minutes ticked by as they tried everything they could. But eventually the harsh reality became clear. The monitor's steady tone seemed to grow louder, drowning out everything else in the room. Dr. Richards stepped back, his hands falling to his sides. His voice was barely above a whisper as he spoke the words he dreaded. Time of death, 8.47 p.m. The room fell silent except for the monotonous beep of the flatlined monitor. Someone reached over and switched it off, leaving an empty silence that felt deafening. Dr. Richards stood there for a moment, staring at Ava's peaceful face. If he hadn't asked her to get that file, if he'd gone himself, the weight of guilt pressed down on his shoulders like a physical force. He walked out of the ER in a daze, his feet carrying him automatically to a quiet corner of the hallway. His hands shook slightly as he pulled out his phone and dialed Emily's number. Michael? Emily's voice was warm and concerned. You're working late. Is everything okay? Em. His voice cracked. We lost Ava tonight. Nurse Johnson. She... She fell down the stairs after I asked her to get a file for me. Hit her head. We couldn't save her. Oh, Michael. Emily's voice softened with sympathy. I'm so sorry. But you know this isn't your fault, right? It was an accident. Dr. Richards leaned against the wall, closing his eyes. If I hadn't sent her... Stop that, Emily said firmly. You can't blame yourself for this. These things, they just happen sometimes, even in horrible, unfair ways. But her words of comfort felt hollow against the crushing weight of responsibility he felt. After a few more moments of Emily trying to console him, he ended the call sliding down the wall to sit on the cold hospital floor. The guilt settled deeper into his chest, a heavy burden he wasn't sure he'd ever be able to shake. The evening air had grown chilly as Dr. Richards sat in his parked car outside the hospital, his hands gripping the steering wheel. He had Ava's home address from her personnel file, and though hospital protocol suggested letting the authorities handle death notifications, something inside him knew he needed to do this personally. I owe her this much he whispered to himself, starting the engine. The drive through the city's quiet streets gave him too much time to think. Each traffic light seemed to mock him with its red glow, forcing him to stop and remember the events of the day. His mind kept replaying the moment he'd asked Ava to get that file, her warm smile as she'd agreed. Twenty minutes later, he turned into a modest neighborhood of small, well-kept homes. 
Christmas lights still hung from some of the houses, though they weren't lit at this hour. He double-checked the address on his phone and pulled up in front of a small blue house with white trim. The porch light was on, casting a dim glow over a collection of children's bikes and toys scattered across the small front yard. A basketball hoop stood in the driveway, its net swaying gently in the evening breeze. These simple signs of family life made his heart ache even more. Dr. Richards walked up the concrete path to the front door, each step feeling heavier than the last. The porch creaked under his feet as he reached for the doorbell. He pressed it and waited, hearing it chime inside the house. No response came. He knocked firmly on the door, the sound echoing in the quiet neighborhood. Still nothing. Just as he was about to knock again, a small voice came from inside. Who is it? The voice was young, curious, but cautious. Dr. Richards cleared his throat, trying to keep his voice steady. My name is Dr. Richards. I'm from Memorial Hospital. I need to speak with the adult who's home. There was a pause, then the sound of whispered conversation. He heard small footsteps moving around inside, and then the porch light flickered on fully, illuminating him in its harsh glare. The door opened slowly, and Dr. Richards felt his breath catch in his throat. Five black children stood clustered in the doorway, looking up at him with curious eyes. Two appeared to be identical twins, maybe six or seven years old. The others looked to be various ages, with the oldest appearing around eight. All of them had Ava's warm brown eyes, and that the oldest boy, standing slightly in front of the others protectively, spoke up. Have you seen our mom? She works at your hospital. The words hit Dr. Richards like a physical blow. These were Ava's children, all five of them, alone in the house, waiting for their mother who would never come home again. The magnitude of the tragedy suddenly felt exponentially worse as he looked at their innocent faces, unaware of how their world was about to change forever. Dr. Richards took a deep breath and knelt down, bringing himself to eye level with the children. His white coat crinkled as he settled on one knee, trying to appear less intimidating to the five young faces before him. Is there another adult who takes care of you? Maybe your father or a relative? He asked gently. Jordan, the oldest, shifted his weight from one foot to the other. Dad left a while ago. About a month, I think. His voice carried a maturity beyond his years. He said he needed some time, one of the twins added quietly. Dr. Richards noticed she wore a small butterfly clip in her hair. Kayla, according to the information he'd gathered. Her twin brother Kevin nodded. But we're okay. Mom showed us how to make sandwiches and heat up soup. We know not to use the big stove. Dr. Richards felt his chest tighten at their matter-of-fact responses. These children had already adapted to one parent's absence, learning to be self-sufficient far too young. The youngest girl, Tina, hadn't spoken a word. She stood partially hidden behind Jordan, her small hand clutching the back of his shirt. Mom usually calls if she's going to be late, Marcus said, his eyes never leaving Dr. Richard's face. The seven-year-old stood with his arms crossed, a protective stance that spoke volumes about the responsibilities these children had taken on. We take turns helping with chores, Jordan explained, standing a little straighter. Mom taught us how to be responsible when she has to work late shifts. The pride in his voice made Dr. Richards' heart ache. Here were five children who had already learned to cope with too much, too soon. They'd developed a system working together to handle their father's abandonment and their mother's necessary absences. That's very impressive, Dr. Richards managed to say, his voice thick with emotion. You all seem very responsible. Mom says we're her little team, Kayla said with a small smile. She'll be home soon, right? Dr. Richards stood up slowly, unable to answer her question directly. He needed a moment to compose himself, to figure out how to tell these brave, resilient children that their mother wouldn't be coming home. I'll be back in just a few minutes, he said softly, fighting to keep his voice steady. I'm going to talk to your neighbors first, okay? The children nodded, though Marcus's suspicious expression didn't waver. As Dr. Richards turned toward the neighboring house, he heard the front door close quietly behind him. Each step felt heavier than the last as he walked across the small patch of grass separating the two houses. Now, Dr. Richards climbed the steps to the neighbor's house and knocked on the weathered blue door. After a moment, a woman in her 60s opened it, her eyes widening with recognition. 
Dr. Richards? From Memorial Hospital? Mrs. Thompson adjusted her reading glasses, peering up at him with concern. Is everything all right? He cleared his throat. Mrs. Thompson, I'm here about Ava Johnson and her children. May I speak with you for a moment? She quickly ushered him inside to a small living room filled with family photos and well-worn furniture. Of course, of course. Please sit down. The floral print couch creaked as they both settled onto it. I need to understand more about Ava's family situation, Dr. Richards began carefully. The children mentioned their father left about a month ago. Mrs. Thompson's face darkened. That man, she said, shaking her head. He's in jail now where he belongs. Got arrested for drug possession three weeks ago. But even before that, she wrung her hands in her lap. He wasn't good to them. Ava tried to hide the bruises, but we neighbors we knew. Dr. Richards felt his jaw tighten. Are there any relatives who could help with the children? None that I know of, Mrs. Thompson replied sadly. Ava was on her own. Her parents passed years ago, and she never mentioned any siblings. Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, he said quietly. You've been very helpful. As he walked back across the patch of grass between the houses, his steps were slow and measured. Through the window, he could see the children waiting, their small faces pressed against the glass. The reality of their situation struck him anew. They were completely alone, with no one to turn to. He reached the front door and took a deep breath, knowing what he needed to do. These children couldn't stay here by themselves. Until a proper solution could be found, they would need somewhere safe to go. Somewhere with someone who could look after them. With newfound resolve, he knocked on the door, ready to tell them they would be coming home with him for now. Dr. Richards returned to Ava's front door, his heart heavy with the weight of what lay ahead. When he knocked, Jordan opened it immediately, his young face full of worry. Children, I need you to listen carefully, Dr. Richards said, kneeling to meet their eye level. Your mother? She's going to be away for a while, and I'd like you all to stay at my house tonight. Would that be okay? But when is Mama coming back? Tina's small voice quivered as she clutched her worn teddy bear. Dr. Richards swallowed hard. We'll talk about everything soon, I promise. Right now, let's pack some things you'll need for tonight. Jordan straightened his shoulders, trying to look strong for his siblings. Come on, guys. Let's get our pajamas and toothbrushes. He guided his younger brothers and sisters upstairs occasionally glancing back at Dr. Richards as if seeking reassurance. The children moved through their modest home with practiced efficiency, gathering necessities in small backpacks. Marcus held on to his favorite toy truck while the twins, Kayla and Kevin, helped each other fold their clothes. Dr. Richards? Kayla asked as they descended the stairs. Did something bad happen to Mama at the hospital? Your mother had an accident, he replied gently, helping them with their bags. But right now, let's focus on getting you somewhere safe for the night. I promise we'll talk more later. They filed out to his car, their small faces reflecting uncertainty in the evening light. Dr. Richards helped them buckle up, making sure everyone was secure before starting the drive. Your house is nice? Kevin asked from the back seat, his voice small. Yes, it's very nice, Dr. Richards assured them, catching their worried expressions in the rearview mirror. And my wife Emily is there. She's very kind. But Mama knows where to find us? Marcus clutched his truck tighter. Dr. Richards gripped the steering wheel, his knuckles whitening. Don't worry about that right now. The important thing is that you're all together and safe. The streets grew wider and the houses larger as they approached his neighborhood. Jordan pressed his face against the window, watching the familiar parts of their world fade away into unknown territory. Almost there. Dr. Richards announced, turning onto his street. The children grew quiet as he pulled into the driveway of a large two-story house. As he helped them out of the car, the porch light flickered on. His wife, Emily, appeared in the doorway, her eyes widening at the sight of five small children climbing out of her husband's car. She stood frozen, one hand still on the light switch as Dr. Richards gathered their bags and led the group toward the house. What's going on? She whispered urgently her eyes darting between her husband and the children. Why have you brought these children home? Dr. Richards ran a hand through his hair, exhaustion evident on his face. Emily, remember the nurse I told you about? 
Ava Johnson. When she nodded, he continued. These are her children. They have no one else. Their father's in jail and there's no other family nearby. Emily wrapped her arms around herself, taking a step back. Michael, we can't just take in five strange children. What about our routines, our peace? This isn't something we discussed. I know, honey, he said softly, placing a gentle hand on her shoulder. But they have nowhere else to go tonight. Their mother died in my hospital, under my watch. I sent her to get those files. His voice cracked slightly. Emily's face tightened with discomfort as she glanced at the children again. But surely there must be someone else? Some services we can call? At this hour, they'd end up in emergency foster care, probably separated. Dr. Richards looked at his wife pleadingly. It's just for a few days until we figure something out. Please, Emily. She shifted uncomfortably, her internal struggle visible on her face. I don't know the first thing about taking care of five children, especially... She trailed off, looking away. They're just children who need help, Dr. Richards said firmly but kindly. We have the space, and it's only temporary. Emily sighed deeply, her shoulders dropping in resignation. A few days, she agreed reluctantly, just until proper arrangements can be made. She stepped aside, allowing Dr. Richards to guide the children into their home. The little ones moved cautiously, their shoes barely making a sound on the hardwood floor. Emily followed them into the living room, where she mechanically went to the kitchen and returned with a plate of cookies and some milk. The children sat close together on the large sofa, their small hands carefully holding the glasses of milk. They ate quietly, their eyes taking in the unfamiliar surroundings while Emily watched from across the room, her posture stiff and uncertain. Let me show you where you'll sleep tonight, Dr. Richards said warmly, gathering their bags. The children followed him up the stairs, leaving their half-eaten cookies behind. Emily remained in the living room, staring at the evidence of their new house guests. Small fingerprints on glass cups and crumbs on her pristine sofa. Next morning, Emily stood near the kitchen doorway, her arms crossed tightly across her chest as she watched her husband work. Do you need any help? She asked quietly, though she made no move to approach the stove. I've got it handled, Dr. Richards replied, flipping another pancake. Could you maybe set the table? Emily nodded stiffly and began pulling plates from the cabinet carefully arranging them on the dining room table. She kept glancing toward the stairs, where the children would appear any moment. Soon, the sound of small feet shuffling down the stairs broke the morning quiet. The five children appeared, already dressed but looking uncertain. Jordan, the oldest, led his siblings into the dining room. Good morning, Dr. Richards called out warmly. I hope everyone likes pancakes and bacon. The children nodded silently, taking seats close together at one end of the table. Emily busied herself with straightening things in the kitchen, avoiding direct eye contact. Would anyone like orange juice? Dr. Richards asked, holding up a carton. Yes, please, Jordan answered softly, speaking for all of them. As Dr. Richards served the food, heavy footsteps descended the stairs. Samantha, their teenage daughter, appeared in the doorway, stopping abruptly at the sight of the filled table. Her eyes widened then narrowed as she looked between her parents. What's going on? She demanded, her voice sharp. Sam, honey, Dr. Richards began. These children needed a place to stay for a few days. I'll explain everything later. Later? Samantha scoffed. There are strangers eating breakfast at our table, and you'll explain later? Emily shot her daughter a look that seemed to say she shared her feelings but remained silent. Samantha, Dr. Richards said firmly, not now. Samantha's face flushed red. She spun around and stormed out of the kitchen, her footsteps thundering up the stairs. The sharp slam of her bedroom door echoed through the house, making little Tina flinch. It's okay, Dr. Richards assured the children, placing a gentle hand on Tina's shoulder. Everything's going to be fine. Let's enjoy this breakfast, and then I'll show you where you can keep your things. The children ate quietly while Emily remained in the kitchen, mechanically wiping already clean counters. After breakfast, Dr. Richards led the children upstairs to the guest room, carrying their few belongings. You'll be comfortable here, 
he said, opening the door to reveal two queen-sized beds. We'll figure everything out together, okay? From the hallway, Emily watched silently, her expression torn between sympathy and uncertainty. Another door slam from Samantha's room made her jump, but Dr. Richards continued speaking softly to the children, helping them settle into their temporary space. I need to head to the hospital today, he said, watching his wife's face. Could you keep an eye on the children while I'm gone? Emily's fingers tightened around her coffee mug. Michael, I don't know the first thing about watching five children. It's just temporary until we figure something out, he assured her. They're very well behaved. They mostly take care of themselves. Emily sighed, her shoulders tense. Fine. But just for now. After Dr. Richards left for work, Emily stayed in the kitchen, organizing cabinets that didn't need organizing. Through the doorway, she could see the children in the living room. They played quietly with some old board games they'd found, speaking in hushed voices. As the morning wore on, Emily noticed how Jordan helped Tina tie her shoes and how the twins, Kayla and Kevin, worked together to fold the blanket they'd used. Marcus carefully put away the games when they were done, making sure all the pieces were accounted for. By early afternoon, Emily's head started to pound. She pressed a hand to her forehead, feeling the heat of a fever coming on. Her limbs felt heavy and weak as she sank onto the living room couch. Samantha? She called out weakly. Could you help me for a minute? Her daughter appeared at the top of the stairs, car keys in hand. I'm heading out to meet Jessica and Ashley, she said, already turning away. I'll be back later. But I'm not feeling well, Emily protested. Take some medicine or whatever. Samantha called over her shoulder as she left, the front door closing behind her. Emily closed her eyes, feeling worse by the minute. When she opened them again, Jordan stood before her, holding a glass of water. Behind him, Kayla carried a bottle of fever reducer from the medicine cabinet. You don't look good, Mrs. Richards, Jordan said softly. My mom always gave us this when we had fevers. I can't ask you to, Emily started, but Kevin was already arranging pillows behind her back. You should lie down, Marcus insisted, while Tina carefully spread a light blanket over Emily's legs. Emily watched in amazement as the children worked together to make her comfortable. They brought her more water, kept their voices down, and checked on her regularly. Their genuine concern showed in their worried glances and gentle movements. Tears pricked at Emily's eyes as she watched them. These children, whom she'd treated so coldly, were showing her more kindness than her own daughter had. Thank you, she whispered, her voice thick with emotion. Thank you all so much. The children smiled at her, and for the first time, Emily felt her heart begin to thaw. Dr. Richards stepped into his home that evening, pausing at the unexpected scene before him. Emily lay on the couch with a blanket draped over her, while the children sat nearby, some reading books and others playing quietly with puzzles. The usual tension in Emily's face had softened. How are you feeling? He asked, setting down his medical bag. Emily smiled, a genuine smile he hadn't seen since the children arrived. I caught a fever today, she said, but these angels took care of me. She gestured to the children, who looked up at her words. They brought me medicine, water, everything I needed. Dr. Richard sat in his armchair, watching as Jordan helped Tina with her puzzle piece. They surprised you? They did, Emily admitted quietly. I was so wrong about them, Michael. They're wonderful children. Later, during dinner, Emily served extra helpings to Marcus when she noticed him eyeing the mashed potatoes. What other foods do you like? She asked, passing him the bowl. Pizza, Kevin exclaimed, and his twin Kayla nodded enthusiastically. Mom used to make the best mac and cheese, Jordan added softly, then looked down at his plate. Emily reached over and squeezed his hand. Maybe we could try making it together sometime. After the children helped clear the table, Dr. Richards and Emily moved to the kitchen while the children settled in the living room. Emily? Dr. Richards began leaning against the counter. I've been thinking about their situation. They need a permanent home, stability. Emily wiped her hands on a dish towel, watching the children through the doorway. You want to adopt them, don't you? I know it's a lot to ask, he said. But seeing them today, 
how they've already become part of our home. Emily turned to face him. They were so kind to me today, Michael. When I was sick, they didn't hesitate to help, even after how cold I've been. She paused, her eyes growing misty. They deserve a stable home, love, security, and somehow they've already found their way into my heart. So you'd consider it? Dr. Richards asked, hopefully. Yes, Emily nodded, watching as Tina helped Kevin pick up some scattered crayons. Yes, I think we can adopt them. The transformation of the Richards' home began with small changes. Dr. Richards and Emily cleared out the spacious bonus room upstairs, their footsteps echoing on the hardwood floors as they measured spaces for new beds. The walls, once a plain beige, soon bloomed with cheerful blue and green paint that the children had picked out themselves. What do you think about this bedspread? Emily asked Kayla at the department store, holding up a pink and purple flowered pattern. The little girl's eyes lit up as she nodded enthusiastically. Shopping trips became family adventures. Marcus carefully selected a desk lamp for his homework station, while Tina couldn't contain her excitement over a butterfly wall decal set. Jordan, ever practical like his new dad, insisted on helping carry the smaller bags. At home, Emily found herself naturally falling into maternal routines. She packed lunch boxes with careful notes tucked inside, helped Kevin practice his spelling words, and showed Tina how to braid her hair. The kitchen became a warm gathering spot, filled with the aroma of fresh-baked cookies and the sound of children's laughter. Samantha's transformation was more gradual. She initially kept to her room, music playing behind her closed door. But one evening, as Jordan struggled with his math homework at the dining room table, she paused on her way to the kitchen. That's not so hard, she said, peering over his shoulder. Want me to show you a trick? Jordan's face brightened. Would you? Soon, Samantha was sitting beside him, patiently explaining multiplication tricks she'd learned years ago. Their quiet studying session turned into a regular ritual, and before long, Samantha was joining the younger children for movie nights and board games. Watch this, Sam, Kevin called out one afternoon, showing off his cartwheel in the backyard. Samantha clapped, then demonstrated her own perfect cartwheel, leading to an impromptu gymnastics lesson for all five children. The house filled with new sounds, footsteps on the stairs, giggles from the new bedroom, and the happy chaos of multiple children getting ready for school in the morning. Dr. Richards installed a row of hooks by the door, each labeled with a child's name, where backpacks and jackets hung in a colorful line. Thirteen years had transformed the Richards household in remarkable ways. The dining room that once held uncertain children now seated, accomplished young adults, their faces bright with achievement and purpose. Dr. Richards looked around the elegantly set table, his heart swelling with pride at how far they'd all come. I can hardly believe it's been 13 years, Emily said, setting down a steaming dish of pasta. Her hair had gained touches of silver, but her eyes sparkled with the same warmth that had grown to embrace these children as her own. Jordan, now 21, sat tall in his chair, his medical textbook stacked neatly in his room upstairs. Dad, he said, using the term that had become natural years ago. I got accepted into the cardiology rotation, just like you. Dr. Richards beamed. That's wonderful news, son. Kayla, her nursing scrubs exchanged for a pretty dress, shared her experiences from her clinical rotations. There was this little girl today, she said, who was so scared of getting her shots. I remembered how mom used to distract us with stories during doctor visits, so I tried that. It worked perfectly. Her twin Kevin chimed in next, adjusting his glasses with the same thoughtful gesture he'd had since childhood. My student teaching is going great. The kids are really responding to the new math games I developed. Speaking of development, Marcus interrupted with a grin. My engineering professor wants to submit my design project to a national competition. His eyes shone with the same determination he'd shown while building with blocks as a child. Tina, her artistic soul evident in her colorful outfit, pulled out her phone to show everyone her latest gallery submission. The curator said it captures both pain and hope, she explained, displaying a painting that spoke volumes about their journey as a family. Samantha, now 28 and successful in her own career, reached over to squeeze Tina's hand. 
I always knew you had something special in you, little sis. Dr. Richards watched them all, remembering the scared children who had first entered his home. The peaceful evening shattered with a single phone call. Dr. Richards had just settled into his favorite armchair, ready to review some patient files, when his cell phone buzzed. The unknown number made him hesitate, but years of medical practice had taught him to answer every call. Dr. Richards speaking, he said, his voice carrying its usual professional tone. Well, well, the good doctor himself. The voice on the other end was rough, carrying an edge that made Dr. Richards sit up straighter. Know me? Ethan Johnson, Ava's husband. Dr. Richards' breath caught in his throat. The name brought back memories he'd rather forget. Mr. Johnson, he managed to say, keeping his voice steady. I hear my kids are doing pretty well for themselves these days, Ethan continued, his words dripping with barely concealed hostility. Medical school, nursing, engineering, you've done quite well with them, haven't you? Playing daddy with another man's children? Dr. Richards gripped the phone tighter. They've worked hard for their achievements, he said carefully. Funny thing about achievements, Ethan's voice took on a calculating tone. I've had lots of time to think in prison, lots of time to piece things together, like how my wife ended up at the bottom of those stairs after you sent her to fetch some files. The words hit Dr. Richards like a physical blow. His hand trembled slightly as he processed the implied threat. I want to see my children, Ethan demanded. They're mine by blood, after all. Unless, he paused meaningfully, we can come to some other arrangement. They're adults now, Dr. Richards responded, trying to maintain his composure. They can make their own decisions. Oh, but you owe me, doctor, Ethan's voice hardened. You took everything from me, my wife, my children. I think it's time we discussed proper compensation, don't you? Unless you'd prefer your kids knowing about your role in Ava's accident. Dr. Richards felt his stomach twist. I need time to think about this, he said, his mind racing. Don't take too long, Ethan warned. I'd hate for this to become... uncomfortable. I'll be in touch. The line went dead, leaving Dr. Richards sitting in his suddenly too quiet living room. His hand shook as he set the phone down on the side table. The weight of Ethan's threats pressed down on him like a physical presence. He glanced toward the hallway where family photos lined the walls, showing the children's growth over the years. The thought of telling them about their biological father's sudden reappearance made his chest tighten. Not tonight, he decided. He needed time to think, to plan, to figure out how to protect his family from this new threat. In a dimly lit apartment on the city's outskirts, Ethan Johnson stalked back and forth across the stained carpet. Empty beer cans littered the coffee table, and the walls showed patches where the paint had peeled away. His face twisted with anger as he muttered under his breath. Living in their fancy house, driving nice cars, going to college. He kicked an empty can across the room. All because of that doctor playing hero. Ethan dropped heavily onto a worn-out couch, the springs creaking beneath him. His time in prison had left him with nothing but bitterness and schemes. He pulled out his phone, scrolling through social media posts he'd found of his children. Their smiling faces only fueled his resentment. My flesh and blood, he growled, tapping the screen with a dirty fingernail. Those are my kids and what do I get? Nothing. Meanwhile, that doctor's living it up, playing daddy with what's mine. He'd spent countless nights in his cell convincing himself that he deserved something for being their father. The fact that he'd never supported them, that he'd hurt their mother, none of that mattered in his mind. All he saw was an opportunity for profit. Grabbing his phone again, Ethan dialed a number. Hey, Mickey? Yeah, it's Ethan. Remember that lawyer you mentioned? The one who handles delicate family matters? He listened for a moment a crooked smile forming on his face. Yeah, I got something that might interest him. Got some kids being kept from their real father by some rich doctor. After ending the call, he made another, then another. Each conversation revealed his true intentions. Not to reconnect with his children, but to use them as leverage against Dr. Richards. The thought of their success only made him more determined to get what he believed he was owed. Fifteen years, he muttered. 
pulling out a wrinkled photo of the children from years ago. Fifteen years that doctor's been raising my meal ticket. Time to cash in. His final call was to a contact known for handling questionable legal matters. As he explained his situation, a smirk spread across his face. Yeah, I got something good here. This doctor's got plenty to lose. My kids are just the key to getting what I deserve. Dr. Richards sat in his home office early the next morning, the weight of Ethan's call heavy on his mind. Sunlight streamed through the window, but it did little to brighten his mood. He watched as his family went about their morning routine through the glass door, Emily preparing breakfast, the kids chattering happily at the table. His hand hovered over his phone. The thought of Ethan's threats made his stomach churn, but the need to protect his family pushed him to action. With a deep breath, he picked up the phone and dialed the number Ethan had left. The phone rang three times before Ethan answered. Well, if it isn't the good doctor, Ethan's voice dripped with fake warmth. I think we should meet and discuss this situation, Dr. Richards said firmly, keeping his voice low to avoid being heard outside his office. That's what I like to hear, Ethan replied. Just a father wanting to reconnect with his kids. You understand that, right, Doc? Dr. Richards noticed the slight edge in Ethan's voice, the way it shifted from sugary sweet to something harder when he mentioned money. There's a cafe on Main Street, The Daily Grind. We can meet there tomorrow at noon. Perfect. Ethan's voice took on an oily quality. You know, Doc, I've missed out on so much. All those years of private schools, nice clothes, family vacations. He let the words hang in the air. We'll discuss everything tomorrow, Dr. Richards cut in, his jaw tightening. Sure, sure. I just want what's best for my children. The word, my, came out like a sneer. After ending the call, Dr. Richards sat at his desk, staring at the family photos lining the walls. Each smiling face reminded him of what was at stake. Emily appeared in the doorway with a cup of coffee, and for a moment he considered telling her everything. Instead, he forced a smile and accepted the cup, deciding to wait until after tomorrow's meeting. Through the window, he watched Jordan helping Tina with her backpack, while the twins playfully raced to the car for their morning ride to college. The sight of his family, because that's what they truly were, strengthened his resolve. He would meet with Ethan and find a way to protect them from whatever schemes their biological father had planned. The morning sun filtered through the kitchen windows as Dr. Richards sat across from Emily at their breakfast table. The house was quiet now, with the children already gone for their daily activities. He wrapped his hands around his coffee mug, gathering courage for the conversation ahead. Emily, there's something I need to tell you, he began, his voice soft but serious. Ethan Johnson called me yesterday. Emily's fork clattered against her plate. The children's biological father? Dr. Richards nodded, explaining the unsettling conversation. He made hints about Ava's accident, suggesting he knows something. He's asking for support to keep quiet. Emily's face darkened with concern. Michael, this isn't about being a father to those children, is it? I don't think so, he admitted, running a hand through his graying hair. He kept mentioning their private schooling, the opportunities they've had. Money. Emily said flatly. That's what he's after. She reached across the table, placing her hand over his. When are you meeting him? Tomorrow at noon at the Daily Grind. Emily sat back, her breakfast forgotten. Let me come with you, she said after a moment's thought. We should face this together. Two sets of eyes and ears might help us better understand what he really wants. Dr. Richards started to protest, but Emily held up her hand. These are our children now, Michael. We both need to protect them. He studied his wife's determined expression, remembering how far they'd come from that first night when the children arrived. Her transformation from reluctant host to fierce protector touched his heart. You're right, he agreed finally. We'll meet him together. But I don't want to tell the children yet. Not until we know what we're dealing with. Emily nodded, squeezing his hand. We'll handle this first, then decide how to proceed. Whatever Ethan's planning, he won't hurt our family. They spent the next few minutes discussing their approach for tomorrow's meeting, their breakfast growing cold, but their resolve growing stronger. 
Together, they would face whatever Ethan Johnson had in store for them. The afternoon sun cast long shadows through the cafe windows as Dr. Richards and Emily approached the daily grind. Through the glass, they spotted Ethan Johnson hunched over a corner table. His wrinkled shirt and unkempt appearance spoke of hard times, but there was something calculating in the way his eyes darted around the room. Ready? Dr. Richards whispered to Emily, who gave his hand a quick squeeze before they entered. Ethan's face stretched into an artificial smile as they approached. Dr. Richards, Mrs. Richards, thank you for meeting me. His voice carried a forced politeness that made Emily's skin crawl. They settled into their seats and Dr. Richards discreetly pressed the record button on his phone in his pocket. The cafe's quiet buzz provided perfect cover for their conversation. I've missed my children so much, Ethan began, his hands fidgeting with a paper napkin. I've changed, you know. Prison gave me time to think about what's important. Emily's eyes narrowed. Really? And what made you decide to reach out now after all these years? They're my flesh and blood, Ethan protested, but his smile wavered. I saw Jordan's picture in the paper, medical school, huh? And the twins doing so well. His voice trailed off as his eyes took on a calculating gleam. Let's be honest here, Emily said firmly. What do you really want, Mr. Johnson? The fake smile vanished from Ethan's face. Look, those kids have had opportunities I never could have given them. Private schools, fancy colleges. He leaned forward, dropping his voice. Seems only fair their real father should get something for that. Dr. Richards remained silent, his hand steady in his pocket as the recording continued. Emily's chin lifted. Their real father? You abandoned them years ago. Maybe. Ethan snarled, his mask completely gone now. But I can make things very difficult for everyone. Unless, of course, Dr. Richards here wants to make a deal. He named a substantial figure, his eyes glinting with greed. And if we refuse? Emily asked, her voice steel sharp. Ethan's face darkened. Then maybe I'll tell those kids all about their real father, and about how their precious Dr. Richards is the reason their mother isn't here anymore. Dr. Richards and Emily exchanged a knowing look, saying nothing as Ethan's threats hung in the air between them. Back in their warm, familiar living room, Dr. Richards and Emily sat close together on the couch, listening to the recording one more time. The afternoon light filtered through the curtains as Ethan's threatening voice filled the space between them. We need to tell them, Emily said softly, placing her hand on her husband's arm. They deserve to know the truth. Dr. Richards nodded, his face etched with concern. You're right. They're old enough to understand, and they should hear it from us first. They called the children together. One by one, they filed into the living room. Jordan, now tall and confident. Kayla and Kevin, the twins who had grown into caring young adults. Marcus, with his thoughtful expression. And Tina, artistic and sensitive. They settled onto the couches and floor sensing the seriousness in their parents' demeanor. There's something important we need to discuss, Dr. Richards began, his voice gentle but firm. Your biological father, Ethan Johnson, has recently made contact with us. The room grew still. Jordan's shoulders tensed while Kayla reached for Kevin's hand. We want to be completely honest with you about what's happening, Emily added, her voice steady. Your father made certain demands during our meeting with him. Dr. Richards held up his phone. We recorded our conversation with him. We think it's important for you to hear it yourselves, so you can understand exactly what kind of person he is and what he wants. He pressed play, and Ethan's voice filled the room. The children listened intently as the conversation unfolded, their expressions changing from curiosity to hurt and anger as they heard their biological father's true intentions. Tina's eyes welled with tears as Ethan's threats about Dr. Richards and their mother became clear. Marcus's face darkened with each passing moment of the recording. Kayla wrapped an arm around Tina, pulling her close. Jordan sat perfectly still, his jaw clenched. When the recording ended, silence hung heavy in the room. Dr. Richards leaned forward, his voice gentle but firm. I want you all to know that you are under no obligation to have any contact with him. Your mother and I will support whatever decision you make. 
The children exchanged glances, a lifetime of shared experiences passing between them. Finally, Jordan spoke for all of them, his voice clear and unwavering. You and mom are our real parents. We don't need or want anything from him. Kayla nodded firmly. He left us when we needed him. You chose us and loved us. That's what real parents do. We're Richards's now, Kevin added, his voice strong despite the emotion in his eyes. Marcus and Tina nodded in agreement, moving closer to Emily and Dr. Richards. The family drew together, their bond stronger than any biological connection or threat could shake. Dr. Richards sat in his study, the evening sun casting long shadows across his desk. With steady hands, he picked up his phone and dialed Ethan's number. His family's united response had given him the strength he needed for this final confrontation. After three rings, Ethan answered with a gruff, yeah? Ethan, this is Dr. Richards, he said, his voice firm and controlled. I'm calling to make something clear. The children have heard the recording of our conversation. There was a brief silence on the other end. What recording? Ethan's voice cracked slightly. The one from the cafe where you revealed your true intentions. They know exactly what you want and they've made their decision. They want nothing to do with you. You can't do this. Ethan's voice rose sharply. Those are my kids. No, Ethan, they stopped being your kids the day you abandoned them. They're my children now, legally and in every way that matters. Listen here, Richards, Ethan snarled, his composure crumbling. You owe me. After what happened to Ava? If you continue trying to extort money from us or attempt to contact the children, I will pursue legal action, Dr. Richards interrupted calmly. I have evidence of your threats and attempted extortion. The police would be very interested in hearing about this. Wait, wait. Ethan's voice took on a desperate edge. Maybe we can work something out. A smaller amount. There will be no deals, Ethan. No negotiations. Stay away from my family. You can't just... Ethan's voice rose to a shout. Those are my flesh and blood. You think you can just... Goodbye, Ethan, Dr. Richards said firmly. Don't contact us again. He ended the call, cutting off Ethan's increasingly frantic protests. Taking a deep breath, Dr. Richards felt the tension leaving his shoulders. He stood up from his desk and walked to the living room, where his family waited. Emily sat on the couch, surrounded by their children. Jordan was explaining something about medical school to Marcus, while Kayla and Kevin played a card game with Tina. As he entered, they all looked up, their faces showing love and trust. Dr. Richards settled into his favorite armchair, sharing a knowing look with Emily. No words were needed. They had weathered this storm together, and their family bond had only grown stronger. If you enjoyed the story of Dr. Richard, I hand-picked this next story that you will enjoy. Please don't miss this one. Click here to watch it.